I want to give a trigger warning. I'm assuming all of us who are here are here knowing that we will go into places which may be traumatic, may trigger something for you. So please be aware of that. This topic is very close to my heart. One reason being, and I'm not saying it's generalized, I'm not generalizing for all of us here, but I come from Mumbai, from India, from a very, very conservative, traditional family. I grew up watching my father beat my mother every night. I thought that is how fathers were. That's what they did. They beat their wives. I grew up in a family where my brother, I have an older brother, was exceptionally emotionally abusive and physically abusive. I really thought through my life, that is how brothers were. And I saw that not only in my family, I saw that in my neighborhood, I saw that amongst my relatives. And then I got married to a man many years ago. That was my first marriage. Fortunately for me, that marriage was peaceful. However, when I left the marriage, my first relationship was with a same-sex partner, with a woman. I have a story written in my book called Untold Lies. And then when people read that story, because I have not given any gender, they assume that that night that I have described is by a man, that no woman would treat another man, another woman like that. But it is a true story. And I was beaten up throughout the two and a half years every evening i would still go to work the next day with bandages i would pretend it was my cat my children i have twins who are now 26 that i had a fall i lived that life and i thought and my story in the book is called punishment i thought as a woman that is what happens you get punished like because you left your marriage you get punished we give ourselves all kind of justifications this is a very interesting topic because i started doing research and what i found online is shocking so do you know the definition for dom dom domestic abuse i did a little poll the other day most people said domestic abuse is when one person hits the other person physically i was shocked that that is not the i let me read the definition it is defined okay domestic uh, uh, violence and abuse is defined as any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling coercive threatening behavior violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members regardless of gender or sexuality let me talking about lots and lots of kinds of uh, abuse we are also apparently and it is not limited to psychological physical sexual financial emotional but also includes honor based violence which is very prevalent in our community as you may know forced marriage female genital mutilation there were some figures that I was looking at. Some of them are unpublished, but they are available on Google. It reveals that 2,086 female patients were admitted to hospital after suffering sexual, physical, or mental abuse at the hands of a partner between April 2016 and March 2020. So we'll come a little closer to the date now. In, the, in a two-year period of 1st April 2020 to March 2022, there were four 170 deaths in total which took place in a domestic setting or following domestic abuse including 43 percent amongst intimate partners now that is very very scary and i'm already feeling i'm already sweating so i'm going to start with the introduction to eva so we have, these are two very strong courageous women who have come forward and to share their story so thank you for that Eva is an activist, writer, and public speaker focusing on transgender rights and mental health using her own experiences to shed light on what is to be transgender. Gosh, Eva has won so many awards, but one big thing that uh, stood out for me was that you took legal action against the NHS England in the High Court to challenge unlawful waiting times for trans patients. So thank you, Eva, for joining us today. Thank you. I'm going to start, go, be, go to MH. I'm going to call her MH. <laughs> now, she's a colleague. When you, you have your colleagues here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. She leads inclusion, diversity, and belonging for Alliance Commercial globally and is also the chair of the Alliance Global Pride Board. She's a member of Board of Link, which is the LGBTQ insurance network, as well as a trustee on the Board of Kaleidoscope Trust and We Create Space. MH's work has been recognized, you know, being listed in the Power List in 2023 and Global Diversity List 2023 and winning inspirational role model at the Rainbow Honors in 2023. That's it from me. I'm going to start with the questions. 
We're going to start with our guest, Eva. Eva, please share your story with us. And what I'm really keen to understand is, why do we hide? Why is it such a taboo? Yeah, well, whenever we hear about the subjects of domestic abuse, any sort of violence against women and girls, especially on the news, it's one of those topics where we kind of, almost kind of look away because we know it's going to be harrowing, we know it's going to be dark. We also know that some of those experiences that we hear about will also touch upon our own lives as well. And it's really difficult to tune in fully and be present in those conversations when a part of us almost kind of subconsciously are almost programmed to just ignore them because maybe it's ingrained within us. And like you were saying, that that's all you know. And you know, when, when you go through experiences, you don't know any better. So for me personally, being a trans woman who's out and proud, I've always wondered where do I fit within this space? I don't want to be taking up space that somebody else could be making use of. But I actually have been, uh, so I am a survivor of emotional abuse as well. For me personally, it was before I came out, during a time that I was gender questioning, um, I was experimenting more with my appearance, and the partner that I was with was, I would probably say, my first adult relationship, the first proper one. You know, you have previous relationships where they don't really come to anything, but this one, I thought, well, this could be it. Um, I actually originally lived in South of Manchester and I actually moved to Birmingham and I moved in with this person. I didn't know anybody when I moved here. And to begin with, everything seemed absolutely fine. But then there were elements of, or just hints, especially because I've always experienced problems with my mental health. I'd get asked questions like, when is your next therapist appointment? Can you bring it forward? Almost as a way to shut down things that I'm trying to express putting it back on me that I'm the problem, that became more and more. We had a joint account, but I had to ask permission every single time if I wanted to look in the account, if I wanted to spend anything. I was expected to go to work. I was in a band at the time. I could go to the studio, but then I'd come home. If I needed to go out with anybody, I'd have to always run it by my partner at the time. And it was incredibly stifling. And I didn't realize that that was any sort of control. I always thought, you know, like we're going back to the, the, the definition, I always picked up on the abuse, the physical side. I wasn't hit, you know, I, I wasn't beaten up, I wasn't hurt physically, and I just thought, it can't be. But it's the emotional side of it, the coercive side of it, all the little things that reduce you to much less than you were. And knowing that I didn't have many friends in Birmingham at the time, it became apparent that I, I couldn't really live my own life. And at one point, I was made redundant. And I thought I would get the support. I was an absolute wreck. But instead, it was my fault that I was made redundant. In that relationship, when we paid bills, it was always 50-50. It was questions like, how are we going to afford this now? How are you going to contribute to this situation? I have bills to pay because it was her house. How are you going to contribute to this? Do you not think you need to do this? Do you not need to think you, you, know, you need to do that? At the time, you don't think about it. At the time, I'm thinking, absolutely right. I've just been made redundant. I need to go out and get a job. What I didn't realize was I was being reduced to just, I'm nothing because I was the one that couldn't hold down a job or keep a job. As I was gender questioning, I had lots of digs, lots of threats as well, because I was in a band, I was quite visible. What do you think people will think about you if they found out? You obviously don't want people finding out, do you? So you better do this. Don't go out because if we get drunk, I might accidentally tell someone. And for me, those were signs that something is not right and it shouldn't have to get to that point. But again, it's all we know. And when you live in this bubble, you don't have many connections. You rely on the people within that bubble. I relied on one person. And for me, I 
I had to do a lot of thinking in, internally in order to kind of break free from that way of thinking. I used to spend as, as much time as I could in our studio. And then when the studio closed at half 11, rather than drive back or get a bus or anything like that, I would walk from the center of Birmingham back. And it took two and a half hours or so. But that for me was a chance to prolong being out, being free not have to go back to that sort of environment and even when that relationship finally came to an end she still had a control over me because i couldn't find somewhere to live immediately i still had all my belongings there i still had to go and sleep on the sofa and even then she couldn't let things go and for me thinking well i'm presenting it as male at the time really you know what have i done what has gone wrong and we never really stopped to think about but maybe it's not us. And that's one of the main reasons why I've hardly ever spoken about this. And over the last six, 12 months or so, I've got more involved with the VORG side of things, looking at trans inclusion, because a lot of trans women, especially trans women of colour, also suffer from emotional abuse within relationships. And it's, you know, when we think about what trans women have to go through, trans women specifically because of what's going on in the media, we're lucky to have a partner and we know that but when that luck turns into something else and the other person knows that they have this control over you because you're too afraid to go and open up to someone else about who you truly are that's when that sort of relationship becomes incredibly toxic thank you uh, eva for uh, sharing that just want to know at that time did you ever go to someone else? Did you talk to your family? Did you talk to your close friends? And how was their reaction? I never spoke to anybody. Um, feelings of shame, presenting as male at the time, but gender questioning, questioning sexuality as well. I was ashamed of who I was as a person, my identity, let alone you know, have to come to terms with the situation that I, at the time, thought I put myself in. I voluntarily moved from South of Manchester. I gave up everything there to come to Birmingham for a job. And I put myself in a situation where I was reliant on one person. So feelings of shame kept me from doing anything, from speaking out. I would not even talk to my bandmates who were some of the, like, the, the three closest people. That was it. And coming from an East Asian background, a very strict traditional East Asian background, there are certain values that I don't agree with, but they've been drilled into me over and over again as a kid, it's really difficult to break free from. Things like seeing my dad at home, um, and it's similar to, to, to your story, the way that my dad treated my mom growing up, I thought that was the norm. And when we look at East Asian culture, it's the, the, the male figures are quite dominant. and. The women are just, you know, you, you're not seen or heard. You're just there to kind of be the homemaker, look after the children. And as a society, that that trickles through from one generation to another. So for me, there was absolutely no way I would speak to someone. Even if I had someone to speak to, I would choose not to because there is that self, sense of pride, that sense of shame. But also, you know, who would believe me? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean... A lot of things within our culture is brushed under the carpet, mm -hmm. right? It's all, I always say, when you open the closet in Asian homes, there are a lot of skeletons that come out, really. But uh, we'll park that and thank you for sharing. And Image, I wanted to know your story. I think we should share it with everyone. And also, is there anything unique to the LGBTQ community in, on, you know, on domestic violence? Yeah, so absolutely this this sense of shame uh, is is i think really prevalent in the lgbtq plus community and you know keeps us from from talking about this so um my my story um to set the scene is about 30 years ago um i had um just come out to myself nobody else knew i had um met my first girlfriend so in those days it was through you know classified ads in magazines you know you didn't have tinder or whatever it was it was old school uh letter writing um so i i met her through this and uh she absolutely rocked my world she changed me profoundly she 
you made me realize who I was. She, it was just, she was just amazing for a while. And then um, I moved to university, so I went to, to Exeter, and she moved down to be with me in Exeter. And that's when the relationship shifted. And um, whenever we'd go out, and Exeter's a very small city, at the time there was only one gay bar, um, and whenever we'd go to that bar, um, she would drink heavily, we'd come back, and she'd beat me. And she'd beat me because I don't know, I spoke to somebody, or I looked at somebody differently, or somebody spoke to me. But this in her kind of provoked her to, to beat me, and this went on, and I didn't speak to anybody about it, because just like you, absolutely nobody knew that I was gay. Nobody, absolutely nobody, and I was so ashamed to have put myself in this situation again, you know, this is my fault. I am the person that's put myself in this situation. This sense of shame was so deep that I, I didn't speak to anybody about it. So th this went on for many, many months, um, and it, always on a Saturday night. Sunday morning, it's as if nothing had happened. So she never apologized. It just literally just brushed under the carpet, and the cycle started the week after. I carried on because stupidly I thought that this was what it was. I didn't know any different. I thought that this was what it was like to be a gay woman. And finally I, I found the courage to leave her um, and I was uh, living in halls of residence and one evening, again she had been drinking, she came uh, knocking at my door at whatever time it was, late at night, and I was so embarrassed to have her make a scene in front of the other people in the halls of residence that I let her in. And that night she raped me. And um, I remember the next day um, meeting my father for lunch and just sitting opposite him and this thing that had, had just happened to me and thinking, I can't talk to you about it. I can't tell you what happened because Telling you what happened would mean telling you I was gay. Telling you what happened would mean sharing this thing with you that is just the most awful thing that's happened to me. Um, so I went to um, the police station and uh, this, again, just to set the scene, it was 30 years ago. I was welcomed by this really lovely young police officer who was really lovely. She sat down with me, she listened to me she made all the right noises, but she said to me, we can't do anything, you need to go and see a solicitor. I'm like, okay, fine. So I went to see a solicitor, um, and I can still see him, this crusty, old, smelly man in this crusty, old, smelly office who looked at me, and I explained to him, I said, I'm coming to see you because I have been raped by my ex-girlfriend. And he looked at me and he said, no, you haven't. It wasn't rape. And he said to me, for it to be rape, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to go into, into detail, but uh, for, for it to be rape, there needs to be penetration. And I just sat there thinking, do you want me to draw you a picture? I know what happened. I know what happened that night, and it was rape. He made me feel so profoundly ashamed of what had happened. He made me, he, you, if you use the, today's vocabulary, he gaslit my experience that I walked out of that solicitor's office thinking this, this can't be it, this can't be my life, I cannot be defined by this. There was so much shame, internalized homophobia as well, thinking I, I hate myself for being gay, I wish I weren't gay, I wish I were different. That if I were different, you know, I'd be happily married with a man or whatever, um, this wouldn't happen. So I went back in the closet for a few years. I thought, I, ca I can't do this, I cannot do this. So I went back in the closet for a few years. Profoundly miserable, profoundly miserable. And um, I, I then, this went on for a few years. And I finally met somebody 
uh, another woman uh, who showed me that actually it was possible to have a, a normal relationship with another woman, that abuse isn't something that happens all the time, that you're not supposed to be beaten because you've been drinking or speaking to other people, and you know that sexual relations are consensual and that's how it's supposed to be. So that, that's my story, and I've, I've never looked back since, since her. Um, but back to your, the first part of your question, you know, I think that what's so prevalent with the LGBTQ plus community and abuse is this sense of shame. Because, and exactly like you, Ava, it was this, this power that she held over me because she would, rem I remember, you know, I was living with my parents still at the time, and her biggest threat is, I'm going to tell your parents that you're gay. Like, oh, please, no, don't tell my parents. I'm not, I, I don't want them to know. She would call me. So whenever I went home during the holidays, she would call me at three o'clock in the morning. And again, you know, olden days, there was just one landline, right, for that for the house, and it would ring. Um, and I can still feel the, the dread when I heard the phone ring at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. I knew it was her. My heart would just drop. And my parents could see me talking to this woman on the phone. And I, you know, I'm, I'm angry with them because they never, never mentioned it. But they could see the state that I was in talking to her. And I didn't want her to win. I didn't want her to have that power over me. But th this, this sense of, yeah, of, of, of shame and power that people have over you, because it's not just about coming out as being somebody that's in an abusive relationship, it's actually so much more that you do not want people to know. So I think that's probably what's prevalent to the LGBT community. Emmett, thank you for sharing that. And I'm gonna give you a big hug after <laughs> both of you. Wow, this reminds me of the times, you know, my times and uh, this person when I was in New Zealand, it's very similar. And I've spoken to a lot of people after my own experiences and this is quite common, sadly. Shame, threats, mm -hmm. bullying. My my ex-partner would tell me if you didn't do if I didn't do anything that they would come outside my office or go outside my neighborhood and shout out she's a lesbian. Now remember there are times when you're just trying to find yourself, you're exploring your own identity. It's a very, very scary place to be. I had just come out of a marriage to a man, and I also thought I think I should just stay married to a man. This is scary to be in a relationship. So they they find your vulnerable spots and they take advantage of that vulnerability, right? So what I'm curious to know is how long were you both in those relationships and what kept you in those relationships for that long? I was in that relationship for about close to four years. Um, it's... It's a bubble. Once you are in that bubble, it's all you know. And for me, I was doing the same thing over and over and over. And it just became, it just became the norm. And you don't think about there could be anything outside of this bubble that's different. If anything changes, it would be me, but not for the right reasons. For example, you know, when gender questioning I ended up going back in the closet as well i just thought i can't do that i can't take the risk of anybody finding out so i just put it all in the box sealed it away so that rather than me thriving and moving forwards i actually took steps backwards and that's something that we all share and yeah you don't think of it as oh this is this is a horrible situation until it gets too bad until you can't take it anymore or it could just be one comment from somebody that makes you think, I didn't realize it wasn't like, you know, it shouldn't be like this at all. But until that actually happens, when a lot of the time it's potluck, you just stay in that. And I just stayed there because I thought, well, this is my first proper, what I'd call, you know, grown up type relationship. This is what those grown-up relationships are like. You you weather the storm together, you move through it together. You just don't realize that you're not going anywhere. So what made you finally leave that relationship? For me, I, I realized this is not right. I'm the, mo the most unha the ha unhappiest I've ever, ever been. And I needed freedom. I needed more creative freedom. I needed to make more friends. I needed my own life. And 
living in Birmingham at the time, it's like I don't know anyone that didn't know them. They had quite a, a prominent role in a very well-known organisation. So the events we went to were all linked to them. The only events I really went to were band-related ones. That was it. And that was that was okay because, you know, in, in her eyes, that was a safe environment. She knew who was there. She knew I couldn't be talking to other people. But, it, yeah, when I started to think I need more freedom, I, this is not me. This is not the reason I really wanted to be here. I thought I have to do something. But even when you reach that conclusion, you don't automatically, you know, reach for the door and go. It's almost like you have to plan your escape. You've got to put all the pieces in the right place. And there was one giant piece missing from, from my exit strategy, if you like, and that was some sort of stability. And that's when I realized the stability I needed is the is stability that I create. And yes, I would struggle to, to find somewhere else to live. I could just move in with someone else. I could do a flat share. It's not the end of the world. And when you kind of reframe your thinking in that way, you don't have to move out and live on your own. You don't have to go back to Manchester and feel ashamed. You can move forward and it just doesn't have to be a massive step. That's for me when I realized, okay, I can take a small step. And I did. Interesting, because I receive a lot of calls similar to yours and they're stuck in relationships. So either they want, they don't have financial independence because that's the biggest problem or they are threatened so badly that they fear for their lives or for what will happen. I know of a case where they've been stopped because they decided to leave the relationship. I like the word you used, exit strategy. And I think that all of us need to, instead of thinking of it as an escape, which we have to, mm. but we have to think of an exit strategy. And it takes a lot of courage and strength to get there. Emesh, I'm really interested in knowing like how long were you in your relationship and how did you finally end it? So only a couple of years. Um, but um, I think it's very similar to you, Ava. I think that the, the, the thinking is, okay, well, who, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. I'm the only gay in the village. I've met, happened to have met this one person. Um, and, you know, I'm never going to meet anybody again. And I didn't know any better. I thought that this was it. And you're right, it's like a bubble and, and it's kind of expected. You're, you kind of prepare yourselves for the beatings. You kind of prepare yourself for, 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 for everything else. And it, it's just, it's normal. It's just normal. Um, and for me, and it's going to sound really awful, but for me, the, the thing was that I, I met somebody else. And I, on reflection, that there was, you know, it, for me, it was a very convenient relationship because she was the manager of the only gay club in, in, in Exeter. And I knew that if I were to get into a relationship with her, she would bar my ex from this. So it was very calculated. I'm not a calculating person, but this happened to be my exit strategy. Um, so that's how it worked. And that's how it worked is that I, I found her and I thought, she's going to help me. She is going to help me. And um, she did for a short while. Uh, and allowed me to get out of that of that situation. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to share something which I've never shared before. Is you in a way you were safer than some of us were. Mm. I know someone else who practically died, and so did I. My nose is not this crooked. It was. It has been crooked because my nose was broken. So one night, all night, I was beaten so badly after a bout of drinking. Uh, she was an alcoholic. My house was completely, I was in New Zealand at that time. My house was completely broken. So she used to wear Doc Martin shoes, so drunk she broke down the entire house. It was a two story house. And in the morning, it was a weekend. In the morning, my husband, ex husband, husband at that time, would bring my children over so he would swap over. I, I couldn't walk to the door. And I, I crawled to the door, and I finally, when he opened the door, he said, Oh my God. He, he quickly went. He put the kids back in the car and he called the police. So, but that was, otherwise I would have continued. I would have just continued. And that is where we have to look for red flags. And so my next question is, do you now, having been through, through these experiences or experience, 
do you understand the red flags do you look at that within yourself as well in your uh, current relationship whether it is with your partner whether it's with your friends or whether with your at your workplace mm. and what do you do about it there's certainly a lot of unlearning that we have to do not just to escape those previous experiences but almost learn behaviors that we've instilled within ourselves things like you know normalizing toxic traits working in like in, in doing what i do i'm always exposed to stories of people being taken advantage of being abused and for me it's spotting red flags has become a lot easier and for me you have to kind of turn it backwards on yourself to kind of always think about what you're doing i'm always aware of if i say this is it going to come across as a red flag to, to someone um i'm always like oh you know if i if i mention we've got to be careful about money are they going to think I'm, I'm controlling the finances? Because I can see how I almost fell for it completely. Yeah. And now I'm so acutely aware of those sorts of behaviors that I, it's almost like I'm too paranoid. Um, but yeah, I, I, I see red flags now and, and my best friend is, is currently doing the Tinder thing, Bumble and all that and trying to find a, a partner and whenever she messages me and says, oh, look at this person, sends me a screenshot, it's almost like marking homework. It's like <laughs> I can say, that, 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 that is not right. You need to, to, to block him now. And it's so much easier now in hindsight. And it's also easier when it's someone else. When it's you, yeah. you don't see those things. And it's a constant effort to have to keep reevaluating yourself to make sure that you're not falling into those traps but at the same time that you know you can be the best person you can be so do, do you need to did you find yourself relying on something externally when you were going through this because a lot of people rely on alcohol or you know substance abuse mm. so did you find yourself relying on something yeah. for support to support you yeah um alcohol was definitely what alcohol was the immediate escape um Prescription painkillers was another one. One night, I, I, you know, I stumbled across a box that I'd been given after surgery. Um, so they became my coping mechanisms, but also I've spent most of my life with an eating disorder. So for me, having a relapse and going back to the eating disorder unit was a bit of a wake-up call that, you know, something isn't right here. But even then, at first, it was... The thing that isn't right is me. I therefore need to go to therapy to, to fix myself. And actually, when I went to psychotherapy, um, I thought I was going to psychotherapy to fix me so I can go back into a relationship and everything will be all sparkles and rainbows. And I actually learned when I was being challenged in psychotherapy that I actually started to think about who I was and what I don't want rather than thinking this is who I need to be please fix me please turn me into that person so I can be the best partner for someone it's it became a very reflective process and yeah that that really empowered me to to really seek help and to, to do something brilliant brilliant and I'm going to come back to more positive things as we go along and MH very keen to know your experience and your do you see red flags and do you see that within yourself as well in your relationships? Yeah, I think what we've been through inevitably marks us. And um, I, I know how I am in my relationships and I know that I always have, but it's also, I, part of it is also who I am in my personality, but I, I tend to, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a people pleaser and I've been a lifelong people pleaser um, and that's never going to change. But I think that's probably been augmented by my experience and also in my, my personal relationships that I'm always overly conscious of how the other person might be feeling, of saying the right things, of, of not wanting to upset them. But I think part of it is down to, to me and my personality and who I am and that's never going to change but also part of it is because of my experience and, and what I've gone through. Sure and I'm just going to go back to New Zealand where I lived and I worked uh, uh, in an advertising agency, a very large agency in fact and I remember one person coming up to me 
one time and said to me, how many cats do you have? I said, I actually had only one cat. And I said, I have five cats to them because the kind of injuries I had looked like I was, I had lots of cats. And then they said to me, you need to take help because I know you're lying. There is something more and do you need my help? Now remember 20 years ago, there was no policy around employee you know, support. Mm -hmm. And this is my next question and I'm going to come to you, Image. And I know that, Elian's here, I mean, looking, okay, can you see the statistics before we get on? This is shocking. Fi only 5%, I'm just going to read a couple of key ones and I'll let you uh, read them. And I'm sure we can make this, these slides available mm -hmm. after as well. So only 5% of employers have specific domestic abuse policies or guidelines in place. But all will have colleagues affected by domestic abuse. And I say this quite regularly when I do my own talks and I host sessions, is we actually, and I know the language use has to be changed, and we'll come to that as well, that we have perpetrators and survivors or victims, as we are called, in every organization. It is a fact. Some organizations are now understanding the value of it and are making, have put, you know, uh, signposting in place. And we'll come to that as well. But look at the statistics. 2.3 million people are affected by domestic abuse in 2019-2020. 56% of employers said that domestic abuse le led to absenteeism. 54% said it caused the quality of the employee's work to suffer. So if for nothing else, to make sure that we keep our people safe in our, in our organization. And Emich, this is where I come to you, and I know you're doing a lot of groundwork on this. Do you want to share what uh, you're doing? Yeah, so we, we have, um, so this slide is, uh, I've stolen from the Employers um, Initiative Against Domestic Abuse. So we are a member of that organization. So this is an organization that brings together um, companies um, with guidance on, on domestic abuse. So we're, we're a member of the uh, Employees Initiative Against Domestic Abuse. We also have um, a domestic abuse policy. We're working on um, having a more robust policy as well. So this is something that we're currently working on um, with, with Alliance UK, so to have a, a joint policy so that both Alliance Commercial in, in, in the UK and Alliance um, UK have the same uh, robust domestic abuse policy. Um, I have undergone um, a training to be domestic abuse champion, and I hate that word, but <laughs> yay! Um, so, so I, I'm the the, the go-to person for people who might be going through uh, domestic abuse. Um, we also have, and um, there is, sorry, hang on. Here we go. Um, we also have uh, mental health first aiders. So we have nine uh, mental health first aiders uh, as of last year. Um, and also we have an employer's um, assistance program. And I've put the, um, the details here, but they can all be found on, on Connect. Uh, and we also have iChampions. So for people who wanted to talk to somebody as a, a safe space, then there are the iChampions in, in place. Thank you. This is so, so, so important. Eva, you do a lot of work in the community. Now tell us, how do you think a community organization can put these kind of safety measures in place? I have to say that what you've got is absolutely phenomenal. And I think that needs to be a standard across all organizations. It's incredibly important to acknowledge your point that in, in any organization, there are those who are survivors or trying to survive, trying to seek help but there are also the abusers in there. Mm. And when you're at home going through that, you go to work to escape it. But it's difficult to escape when you think, actually, anyone in this room could be. The person I go and speak to could be. So to have recognized systems in place uh, and, and schemes where people can speak out knowing that it will be confidential, knowing that the person they speak to is a safe person is, is imperative. And we need to take those processes, we need to take those uh, initiatives and implement them in every organisation and in you know anywhere, no matter how big or how small, even if it's your local LGBTQ plus group, from a grassroots point of view, you know, recognise that the people using that service could potentially be survivors or undergoing 
abuse at home. So put something in place. Train all staff members to recognise service users who, who may exhibit certain signs. But I think, you know, something like this, it's down to all of us to implement wherever we can, not just in, you know, international global organisations. Even if you're just a sole trader, if you deal with clients and you interact with clients, look for signs because they're not going to tell you. But if you spot those signs, just, you know, how you had someone reaching out, just that little comment of saying, get help, are you okay? Can I do anything? That can be the life changing moment for that person. Sure. You know, Eva, you mentioned when we spoke about this earlier, you said that it is important for us to normalize these conversations mm -hmm. because this entire conversation is about breaking the taboo. So the more we talk about it, because I remember reaching out to a lot of clients for many, many months, because this is, like I said, a subject close to my heart. And I've always received a negative saying, sorry, we, we don't have these, this issue or this doesn't come in the corporate space. This is, this is no conversation to have in a corporate environment. So the fact, how, how do we make sure that we normalize this? Do you think that we should have more conversations like this? Are you open to having more conversations? Can we do this within our, uh, our networks as mm. well? So when somebody, sorry, when somebody comes to us and talks about it, typically from an Indian point of view, we don't want to talk about it. Sorry, you're exaggerating. They judge you, they blame you. So how do you think we should take this forward? We need to create a culture within workplaces where we can talk about these things openly because if not, then all we're doing is creating an area where abusers can thrive because they know that those who are trying to survive, those who are undergoing that abuse will be too scared to speak out. We need to talk about it and normalise it to the point where we flip it. Those who are the abusers who come into the workplace pretending everything's okay, we need to flip it so that they feel so uncomfortable being in that workplace, knowing that they are completely outnumbered. And we can do that through talking about it. Because talking about these really difficult and dark subjects allows the, those points to be heard. They may not take part in it directly, even hosting something like this today. There could be somebody upstairs aware that this is taking place, thinking, yeah, I hope, you know, I hope no one clocks onto me being an abuser or anything yeah. like that. But we need to call it out. And we can't obviously just go around pointing fingers. But by doing this, we are calling out. We are taking action. We're saying we won't stand for it. We will speak out about it. We will offer help to those who need it. And those who are abusers, then we'll deal with, the, with them. Sure. And before we open out for Q&A questions here, you know, one of the things Emmett you said is because I was using the word victim. I said domestic abuse victims because that's what all I saw online. You said that's not the right language to use. So I want you to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, no, I, I um, it jarred with me because and uh, and I'll tell you why, because I I have only spoken about my story openly uh, for the last six months or so there are people in my life uh who i've known for a very very long time who don't even know this about me um so i've really only started speaking about it for the last six months and um there is a point to my story i promise and i promise i'll make it short but the 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 the, the kind of the click moment for me was i listened to a podcast um and somebody was talking about their abuse and she said I'm not using the word victim because I am not a victim. I don't want to be seen as a victim, I'm a survivor. And this for me was like, oh, this is just the most amazing thing. And it's, I refuse to use the word victim. I refuse to use it because I am not a victim, I'm a survivor. We're all survivors and for me, I, I want that word banished because I'm, and I'm just seeing here victim support. Like, yep. no, I don't yep. want it. It's not victim support. It, but yes. I know that it's that's what it is. Yep. But for me, that that word uh, is it just it shouldn't figure in in this domain. Yeah, and that is the message for today. That mm. if we uh, see ourselves in that situation where we are being abused, reach out to a friend, to a colleague, to your workplace, and I'm sure we'll get the support we want because we're all survivors. Now, let's, just before we end, please, questions, any questions for Eva and Image? 
there, Nora. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nora. Thank you so much for inviting me. This has been so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing it. Kind of really you want to just stand in yeah. because it's so uh, so I, I, love the, I love the concept I have a question though, this is really it's taking the other position. I wonder this is not my curiosity. I wonder are all abusers the way that they are abusing or is there a chance that abusers have learned certain behavior? Which might be let's say just in thinking about the corporate world and the police in the corporate world are abusing on a regular basis of domestic abuse because it's not within a romantic setting usually, they don't cohabit, but there are certain traits perhaps that might be parallels. I think we all hear our mission to create a safe, non toxic working space, working space, everyone can thrive and believe it. So I wonder what can we do to help each individual to stop them becoming abusive by increasing the awareness as well. So telling both sides of the teaching that would be my Sure, you want to? That's a really good question. Um, I think I, I've, I've always wondered about this, and I think there are elements of being very self aware in, in what they're doing, but almost as soon as they realize what they are doing, they find ways to justify and support the continuation of that. And that does stem from upbringing, what they've been through themselves. And yes, there are elements um, where we can help people to, you know, stay on the right track, as, so to speak, so that they don't end up that far gone. And that's things like, I love what you said about not using victim. Things like that, where someone you hear someone say victim, just say, hey, no, can I just stop you there? We don't say victim because of X, Y, and Z. It's like this. And just by having those little connections, those moments of interaction with somebody, pointing out or actually, you know, we shouldn't do things like that. We should do it like this because of respect for others. We start to create that culture that is educational, that is nurturing, where people can thrive, where people who maybe they have been brought up, you know, with a very difficult upbringing, that have, they haven't had a chance to learn about relationships and interactions with others. This is their chance to learn. And those small interactions, you're guiding them gently down the right path. And if I can just add to that from a corporate perspective, I think that for that to happen, you need to build a culture where, you know, it, it, there is psychological safety. So that people feel safe to be able to have these conversations where people feel safe to be able to, and it's not just about calling out people, and I, we, we, you were talking about, you know, sort of bullying in the workplace, but it's not just about calling out the bullying, it's about calling in as well, and I really believe that you have to, and this is what you were saying, that, you know, to, to say to them, okay, well, you said this, it made me feel like this because, please don't do it again. I think that's really, really important as well. I, I agree fully. And I, I will just add to that as well. I think a lot of abusers don't know that they're abusers, but a lot of them know as well. So mm. change only happens when you are self-aware. Yeah. And I have learned that, that when I speak with people who have abused me, or I have been uh, sometimes part of that as well. So I think it's a very really good in to have these conversations, to understand, to not deny yourself that knowledge either, and not to pretend that you are not an abuser because all of us have traits that are quite sometimes learned from childhood like you said from our culture from our exposure i see a lot of our my community men behave in a certain manner not because they love being that that kind of person it's only because that's the only thing they know so we have to call out and make sure that they are aware and if after that they don't change then you can't help them right so that's not just also say yeah. that um I work a lot with the Metropolitan Police and West Midlands Police and also the Crown Prosecution Service, predominantly in hate crime. Um, I sit on the hate crime panels. But there's a, uh, a process called restorative justice, which where, you know, if you, for example, are a victim of hate crime, rather than it go through to prosecution and a custodial sentence, there is the option to sit down in a safe a neutral place with the person who you know who committed that hate crime against you and talk about it how it made you feel that you know I understand this is your upbringing but your upbringing had this impact on me to talk and to learn because sometimes custodial sentences don't work 
it makes an individual even more bitter, even more angry, and they'll resent you even more for it. And that's something that is possible within the workplace. And, you know, it's not restorative justice when it's in the workplace. It's that conversation, isn't yeah. it? Yes. It's that conversation of these words that you're using have a profound impact on me. And if you allow me to, to talk about that, that impact, hopefully we can all learn and move forward. So that is absolutely vital. Fantastic. Yeah, Chris? Uh, first of all, thank you um, for three uh, incredibly personal and powerful um, and painful stories. What I picked up as a big theme was it's really important to talk about this. This flourishes, um, uh, this, this flourishes when people are silent. So as a community, as an LGBTQIA plus community, is there anything else we can be doing to encourage that conversation, to get people talking about it? And how can we make your support that I would say social media is a fantastic yeah, yeah, tool yes. because 99% of us are glued to little black rectangles most of the day anyway. <laughs> and information is so easy to share these days. You just literally click, send, less than two seconds. That's how easy it is to share. And when you come across information, personal stories on social media where you think, my social circle, my peers, those that follow me, could really benefit from this, share it. You know, a lot of people are so worried on social media about cultivating the, this kind of image, making sure everything's perfect and happy and bright. That's so far from reality. You know, there are ups and there are downs. It's not all about, you know, you're half a grapefruit on a crisp white linen sheets and a book you'll never read. It's yeah. about the realities of our lives. Share those realities. Make sure that if it touches you and you think, really, this has taught me something, share it. Don't be ashamed to share it. And that's, the, that, that's vital because the moment you feel like maybe I shouldn't, I don't want to upset my followers, I don't want to upset people in the workplace by sharing these details, by having this conversation, you're allowing abuse to happen. So, you know, a, a one way to stand against that is to just be really active as an ally to those survivors. I agree. And I... I Weirdly, one of the first places where I shared my story was on LinkedIn. It was very strange, but I, I wrote about it and I did think about it. And I, I mean, I, I don't have that many people following me on, on, on LinkedIn, but I, I thought about it before posting it and I thought, do I want to do this? Do I really, really want to do this? Um, and I did. And, you know, I, I had brilliant, you know, mostly positive feedback from, from what I did. And I, I don't regret it. But yeah, I think it, it's social media is super important. Excellent. Just Chris, to your point, I wrote a script a couple of years ago on domestic violence because I read a statistic which shocked me. It's from the US. 44% of couples and same-sex people in same-sex uh, relationships have reported violence, domestic violence, versus 34%. Now, just 34% just amongst, amongst the heterosexual couples. Now, just wow. 44 versus 34. And that too, in a community where it goes unreported mostly because you go to the cops and then nothing really happens after that and i know you work with the met police and i do uh, a lot of work with them as well but a lot of us are scared to report it we're afraid to report it so that that is one so i wrote a script and i put that script out in the public domain in india because that's has a huge amount of domestic violence and one person came back to me said interested but we will have to twist the story we'll have to twist the narrative it can't be between two men or two women it has to we can't show the faces which has to be just voices morphed. so i said okay it's not going to happen this year so uh, any more questions <sighs> yeah <coughs> so thank you all for today i learned a lot and i hope you all so my question is, as a young queer person experiencing my first queer relationships, what advice would you give, for example, your younger selves or the current generation on how to actually tackle them in a situation? Yeah, um, being open and honest about everything, about experiences, because, you know, I, I I grew up at a time when Section 28 was enforced. You don't talk about it. And because of Section 28, 
until it was repealed, there's a section of queer history that's just completely lost. We're having to fill those gaps in now. So talk about it openly. Let's be the generation that fills those gaps in. And yes, you know, some of those stories will be negative, but sometimes you need that negativity to kind of spur on positivity as well. So yeah, as long as you're both open to talking about how you're feeling, you're both aware of what goes on, because we, we tend to see domestic abuse as a cishet kind of thing. You know, it's cishet white males, they're, they're the ones who, 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 who cause all this. And as, as a marginalized group, we don't often associate it with, with ourselves, with, with our own group, because we think, well, we've been through enough, surely we wouldn't do it to each other, would we? But it does happen. So we need to be transparent about that and be realistic that yes, it could happen. And when it does, we talk about it, we educate others so that we can prevent it happening again. Yeah, talk about it, talk about it. Be proud, you know, this, this sense of shame that I've carried for so long, uh, I regret it. I, I wish I hadn't. Um, so yeah, be proud. There's no shame and just yeah, talk about it. Emmett, you said something initially which I wrote down and you said, I did not let them win. Mm. You said that to me earlier. Yeah. That I think one of the things we need to allow ourselves is not to give our power away, which takes a lot of time to understand. But this new generation, the, your gen the younger generation, I think you have more access to information, more access to knowledge, more access to stories. People like us are opening up and telling us stories as well. So you have that information. It's what do you do with that? How do you use it to your advantage is what you have to uh, look at. So if there are no more questions, I'm just going to add uh, two little things before we end. And one is how many of you have heard the Nigella Lawson incident when she was out having lunch with her now ex-husband he abused her and everybody took photographs and talked about it, but nobody went to help her. Okay, so that is one, park that in your mind. Second is, I'm just, it's not a domestic violence case, but my partner and wife who's here, we were walking down South Bank two years ago on a busy evening. It was, there would have been lots and lots of people. It was October, beautiful evening. We got attacked by a man who was at least six foot two inches, like. I'm five foot nothing, so I had to look up. We were attacked very badly. We don't know why they attacked us, whether it was homophobic, whether it was to do with race. He made a lot of comments about my being Indian and unprovoked. He, when I tried to film it, I still have a video of him. He slapped me so hard. I flew from one side to the other. I have the phone flying with me, but I was too ashamed of friends of mine. Sorry, so what happened at that time? People just gathered and all they were doing was taking a video. I was crying. I was telling, please help. And Nicola uh, has a uh, disability. So I was begging people to help us. No one came forward. All they did was film it. That was the end of it. A security guy was there, not help. They shut the door on us. So this is what happened. So my question to everyone is, when we see abuse happening around us, what role do we play? That's all. I don't want you to respond. I want you to ask yourself, are you just bystanders? Are we bystanders? Or do we just pick up our phone and take photos for social media or videos for social media? That is society because when people ask me, say, how will society change? I ask myself, because I am society, how will I change? What am I doing to make this society a better place? And I feel very positive, although we've been through a lot of traumatic incident, I feel very positive that we are all in a good place, we are survivors. Thank you for sharing the story. I have to point out one wonderful person here who is Eva's wife. So it shows that we've all come out of it. That's my wife of 70, 17 years. So that we've all turned our lives around. We are survivors, that we have taken positive action with our life and that it is possible and not that difficult to make sure that if we find ourselves you know, uh, part of the abuse, call out. Yes, uh, Sian? A lot of the times when we report anything, whether it's hate crime, domestic violence, anything like that, it's not taken seriously. It's our fault. Um, even with solicitors, as MH has, has told us, 
we need to keep going because yes, you know, when we try and report something we're not taken seriously, it gets put to one side. Sometimes you don't even get a crime reference number. We need to keep going. And I see all the time when something happens, it's a negative experience with the criminal justice system. The negativity on social media is like wildfire. But we have to be careful what we're posting on social media. That's our experience and our experience alone. Yes, sometimes it aligns with the experiences of others, but there are those out there who have very positive experiences as well with the criminal justice system. And we've got to be careful that we're not so angry and frustrated that we drown out those positive experiences and replace them with solely negative ones, because that will mean we become this community this echo chamber of negativity and we'll never be able to break free from that and also if we have an opportunity to work with the criminal justice system embrace it go for it because i hear all the time you know the police need to do better they need to do this they need to do that well what if they genuinely don't know how to do better let's show them let's work with them let's use our lived experiences to highlight what is not working what is working and let's move forward together because otherwise in 10 years time we'll still be here yeah. hating the police police not understanding us and to your second point about social media and tackling the negativity on social media um first of all i mean i i try not to respond unless i absolutely have to um I, I can be quite passive aggressive. I'll take a screenshot, name and shame and things like that. But generally, there are those who feel emboldened by social media because it's too easy to hide behind a screen or a keyboard and just throw hate out there. But what kind of life is that? And if you reframe that situation and you think, well, actually, I'm going to go and play with my dog now. I'm going to go, go out with my wife, my partner. I'm going to do something with my life. They're still sat there throwing comments. If we ignore them, they don't go away, but it makes our lives a hell of a lot more bearable. So, you know, we can't end it without the help of the social media platforms actually taking action. So there's another thing we can do, work with them. We can always hold them to account. If we stop, like Twitter's a great example. Um, a lot of people have migrated away from Twitter because it's become this platform full of hate. People, uh, organizations have stopped advertising on Twitter as well. Um, move away from them. You don't have to use it. And gradually they will realize this and they'll, they'll start to look at what is failing with our platform and move forward from there. A lot of platforms also have panels that you can get involved in and surveys where you can contribute and they're really worthwhile doing so as well. I just keep saying, keep the faith. Mm. Yeah. And be the change you want to be. Yeah. See, don't don't be a silent observer. That's all I say. Just participate in a positive manner. So thank you very much. Yeah, MH and Eva, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming and listening to us. Please feel free to share feedback at the outsp at outspoken at outspokenspeakers.com. And if you have any further questions, we are going to be here for the next 45 minutes or so. And please feel free to ask us questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.